Good morning and welcome to the webinar. So my name is Roger Royce, the Royce Law Firm in Menlo Park, and today we have a presentation on blockchain, blockchain technology. And I think all of us probably understand blockchain as the technology that underlies Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but you know blockchain has become so much bigger. Uh, it's now a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger technology that is used way beyond Bitcoin. In fact, we're going to be hearing today about some of the other applications, including in the legal world, which is where, where we live. Uh, smart contracts, um, ledgers, capital markets, intellectual property, voting, uh, there's all airline ticket sales. We've heard all sorts of applications, uh, musical digital rights. And we have a panel here today that is going to talk about how blockchain uh, technology can apply to all of these industries and may just be uh, very revolutionary. So again, I'm Roger Royce. I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm. This is one in a series of our in our webinar series. I hope you sign up for all of them. Uh, we do this every week or two, and we are just now starting our spring series, starting with blockchain. We also have presentations coming up on artificial intelligence, health tech, uh, virtual and augmented reality, fintech. Um, and the Federal Trade Secrets Act. So um, make sure you sign up and can participate in our later, later presentations. So for today, you'll notice on your dialog screen in the lower right-hand corner, you have a chat box. If you have questions as the speakers are presenting, go ahead and type your questions into the chat box um, and uh, we'll try and get to them before we're finished here today. If not, we'll go ahead and get back to you by email and we'll follow up directly. I also want to mention that we are recording this webinar. Uh, you'll be able to access it on the Royce University website under webinars. You'll also be able to find it in the YouTube store, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, podcast store uh, in iTunes. And we also have it posted in the Royce Law site on YouTube. And that should be up by the end of the day. So our panel today is very diverse. Um, we have Stuart Gunther, who is a venture capitalist. Uh, he's also a mentor. Uh, he develops and analyzes business opportunities um, in, uh, and market entry programs. And he is a frequent speaker on early stage ventures and, and global economies. Uh, blockchain is, of course, one of the areas in which Stuart's venture capital uh, activity and consulting activity is, is focused. So Stuart's going to give us the, the VC perspective on this. We also have Rosario, I'm going to probably not pronounce this right, Ingardiola. Okay, great. He's the founder and C-level executive uh, with a deep technology literacy uh, in customer-facing product management. He spent 15 years designing and developing large-scale real-time enterprise trading systems, uh, and he has quite a bit of knowledge in fintech generally in blockchain in particular. Erica Riel Carden, she's an attorney here at Royce with our Royce Law Legal Incubator Program. Um, she is going to speak to uh, some of the legal issues that, that are developing around this new technology. And finally, we have Ryan Singer, who is the CEO at the Blockchain Clearing Corporation here in the San Francisco area. And he is an accomplished entrepreneur and leader in Bitcoin uh, and uh, also now in blockchain. So I think where we'll start is with you, Stuart, if maybe you could give us sort of an introduction to blockchain, what it is, um, why it's interesting to you as an investor. Happy to. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So again, this is Stuart Gunther. Uh, I am the co-founder of the Venture Capital Roundtable. I'm also involved with uh, Seed and Series A Stage Venture Fund, which and we're in the process of raising our second fund, which is focusing on the intersections of IoT, FinTech, and Big Data, and therefore blockchain is a logical component uh, within that focus. What I'd like to do is start off with, from our perspective, from a venture perspective, the look at blockchain and Bitcoin, uh, give kind of a framework and then spread uh, that into specific areas of focus and applications that are of interest to us as a fund and others like us. 
So first of all, everyone is, as was stated, very familiar with Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, which is a decentralized virtual currency. There's been a significant amount of venture interest as well as business interest in the currency itself and the supporting technologies to facilitate that. And blockchain is the underpinning, underlying critical aspect of this currency. It's a public distributed ledger which allows for a, uh, an assurance, a distributed trust vector for transactions that happen within the cryptocurrency of Bitcoin or that can be extrapolated beyond that into following the chain of custody of any asset or any verifiable uh, activity. A uh, blockchain in and of itself is, as was stated, it's a public ledger that allows for the distributed understanding and tracking of all transactions. Uh, this, we believe, creates, uh, built within the system, a significant trust infrastructure, and that's critically important for cross-border transactions, for uh, asset tracking, uh, and a, a host of other areas. And furthermore, it has built within it uh, some strong anti-fraud characteristics. Since the transaction ledger itself is distributed across the network and across nodes, it would be it's a lot more difficult for someone to go in and try and manipulate that ledger and manipulate individual transactions without having the ability to quickly uh, go back forensically and determine what should have happened. Uh, there's two types of, of blockchain implementations that we think are particularly interesting. And there is the permissionless, which is the, the ledger-based open, allowing everyone to collaborate and access that ledger, allow everyone to be able to access the, the, the blockchain uh, technology and being able to therefore uh, spread as diverse and as diverse regions and as diverse a method as possible uh, information about the network. This is particularly useful in uh, where we're worried about any sort of censorship or any type of data manipulation within a public environment. Another area uh, which is going to be equally of interest, especially in the enterprise space, are the private applications. Uh, this would be for the creation of internal uh, uh, internal uh, mechanisms, either inside of, uh, of an enterprise or inside of a, a use chain. It allows for greater speed within processing and speed of, of checking what happens within that ledger, but it also does create some transparency control mechanisms, whether you what you want to expose outside of your network and also what you want to expose even within the actors inside of the network. There are other mechanisms uh, that I think might have been mentioned already, already, Ethereum and Hyperledger. These are two examples of alternative uh, technologies that are trying to uh, apply into the same general space. So there's some, some macro uh, interest areas. I'm sure the other panelists may want to extend and, and uh, uh, go beyond what I'm sharing here. We personally think that banking and fintech is a logical first entry point. Following that would be data storage and, and big data uh, as it relates to the, the ledgering, forensics, et cetera. Ownership questions. This has a significant impact on chain of custody, cross-border transactions, uh, taking things that are normally either complex in terms of understanding truly uh, who owns this piece of, of uh, asset or where the transactions themselves are happening at a, a high enough volume that the need to be able to quickly go back and reconcile those transactions on a semi-regular or regular basis is required. And then some areas which can have some specific use cases are everything from education and government and energy. There are applications within different types of transaction models which can benefit from this type of, of uh, uh, from this type of technology. A couple of resources that I might direct folks to, and I'm sure there will be some others shared, are things such as the Blockchain Futures Lab, which is taking a look at uh, uh, this technology from an artistic viewpoint, how can this impact overall society? And then of course uh, uh, one place to go to is uh, Coindesk, uh, which is a website that has videos and, and uh, information about uh, blockchain and Bitcoin. So let me talk a little bit about what's particularly interesting from a Viaduct Ventures perspective and ways that we think blockchain can uh, uh, impact and disrupt at the same time. 
So first, within the banking and the fintech space, uh, the easy, low-hanging and immediate fruit is dealing with payments and remittances. Uh, we, we believe that blockchain, especially with cross-border as or other complex interdependent uh, relationships uh, within a chain of custody, there can be some real opportunities in terms of cost reduction and also uh, we believe an increase in fidelity of the data, uh, a ability to have greater granularity and understanding of what's happening within the transactions and also what information can be trusted as transactions actions are uh, assessed and then executed. And we also believe that this can lead to a specific and significant disruption within existing payment models. This is it's more than just being able to leverage Bitcoin as an alternative currency or Bitcoin as a transaction vehicle across currencies. Uh, we think actually this can change the way transaction volume and transaction ha can happen on a B2B level as well as a B2C level, starting first and foremost though on a B2B space enterprise to enterprise, automated transaction, automated reconciling. Uh, uh, furthermore, we think that this is a way of, of through the distributed trust mechanisms and also uh, through the ease of access, a way of facilitating the cross-border, uh, especially complex uh, contracts and complex transactions that happen. Uh, from that, uh, we think that this will lead in terms of asset tracking and in terms of asset verification. This also can create some interesting opportunities. In the VR, AR, and gaming space, uh, virtual assets are increasingly of interest and increasingly uh, bought and sold on secondary and tertiary markets understanding who actually has access and a chain of ownership of those assets is a critical uh, inhibitor in this space and also a critical trust mechanism that the uh, application developers uh, themselves have to worry about. And one of the areas of potential interest dealing with ownership will be actually tracking on a virtual goods level, tracking on everything from, from uh, not just what's the data asset, but how is that asset represented within uh, different application stacks is going to be very important. Uh, as people buy and sell potentially uh, virtual assets from different mechanisms, swap them, how do the different systems actually register the new ownership and apply that ownership appropriately. Uh, so virtual goods will deal uh, deal with very uh, very effectively on the data side, data storage, and on the big data side, uh, the easy ones to look at are forensically looking at asset tracking, uh, data tracking, data verification, forensic analysis of transactions. Uh, we're already seeing uh, interesting applications in the legal and in the medical space. Uh, we're seeing uh, just as that's being applied within trying to understand a chain of custody of paper, a chain of custody of information, the question then also becomes where else can it extend and what's really important to us is understanding where the profit models are and the profit matrix are in terms of this type of forensic or data tracking information. Uh, additionally, from a disaster recovery standpoint, when we're dealing with uh, very fluid, very dynamic, very high fidelity information streams, uh, the question becomes: Are we going? Are we finding interesting business models, interesting technologies that do not produce overhead into the transaction flows, but provide quick disaster recovery and/or the ability to uh, quickly ascertain what transactions should or should not have happened during an outage or during a partial outage? These are areas and pain points believe blockchain can significantly disrupt existing models and provide value and therefore generate premiums for our portfolio of customers. Uh, briefly, two other areas that might be of interest uh, are just as we've talked about uh, doing transaction flows as it relates to currency, perhaps there's also mechanisms in disrupted markets i.e. energy markets in secondary economies, emerging economies, where in places like South America or India or uh, MENA, where you've got large energy producers who don't truly have control all the way to the last mile, last hundred feet, because of energy theft and energy sharing that's going on. 
uh, ways to facilitate a uh, better understanding of these microgrids and being able to share as on one level, very interesting. And on the flip side, here in the U.S. Uh, and other markets where you have a lot of uh, sustainable energy growth, there are barriers and challenges in terms of sellbacks and buybacks to the to the grid itself. The it will be interesting to see either on a campus level, on a business level, and on on an indi on an individual level. Does this provide mechanisms for sharing energy resources, buying and selling your energy resources around the grid until we get that worked out? Uh, does this allow for essentially ad hoc sharing of, and selling and buying and selling of energy uh, at different peak times without it being restricted by the grid as it were? So those are some, some macro areas for us. Uh, what's particularly interesting, if I can uh, be a little bit self-serving, what's particularly interesting to us as investors in terms of working with early stage companies, uh, we tend to focus on seed through Series A investments. We look for uh, management teams that have existing technology in place where they're demonstrating an understanding of their market and how they are going to significantly disrupt that market uh, and, and uh, change how the revenue flows and the premium flows uh, operate in that space. Uh, we are particularly of interest, we send overweight between Silicon Valley and uh, Eastern Europe uh, because we believe there's some significant opportunities in talent arbitrage as it relates to these complex problems. So if you've got a compelling technology, a strong team, an existing product, uh, please do think of us. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stuart. That was a really good overview. It gives us a good flavor of what the different applications are. Uh, our, our next speaker uh, is Rosario, who actually has some slides. So why don't you go ahead and you can accept. There you go. Uh, Rosario, your slide should be popping up any second here. Okay, Rosario. All right, very good. Um, so most, uh, I'm currently the CEO and founder of a, of a stealth mode company um, that's uh, just closing on funding called OTC Exchange. Um, most recently, uh, I uh, founded a company called FX1, which was sold to an investment bank in New York that um, basically built large-scale foreign exchange uh, ECN technology and, and operated the same. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, at a, from a very high level, just blockchain and trading. Um, it's definitely obviously interesting to me because that's my background, but it's also the, the largest use case by far. And to put that into perspective, uh, OTC FX trading alone represents about $5.3 trillion a day of turnover, which is uh, about 50 times larger than all global stock exchange turnover um, on a daily basis. It's interesting though, uh, it's a very nascent market segment. There's, there's lots of companies trying to do things there. Um, a lot of pivoting. It's definitely a lot harder uh, than it looks. There, there, there's some interesting uh, theories about what kind of problems people want to solve with blockchain and then there's always the, the market realities of those things. Um, there's dozens of, of proof of concept projects. There's publicly announced projects as well as uh, many that are uh, privately sponsored by various market participants that stand to benefit from them, whether it's the banks, the exchanges, or consortiums of, of those sorts of things. The one thing that they all seem to have in common is that they're, they're leveraging blockchain, but not the public blockchain uh, that it, people are familiar with from a Bitcoin point of view, but uh, basically private permission blockchain. So, uh, the, and there are many software vendors and platform companies uh, that are uh, in that space that, that, that have solutions that are being used with these proofs, the con uh, proof of concept projects. And some of them are uh, getting close to production, if not already in production. And the other thing that most of them are using are smart contracts. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, briefly in just a moment. Um, looking at some of the high-profile proof of concepts that are, are out there, um, the, the T0, which is an overstock subsidiary, they're creating a settlement system or have created a settlement system. Um, probably the big, uh, most familiar one, Digital Asset Holdings, uh, who was responsible for, uh, I guess, almost probably 40% of the total 
uh, assets raised in the first quarter of this year related to blockchain was their $60 million raise there. They've got a proof of concept with the Australian Securities Exchange, uh, again, focused around uh, clearing and settlement chain of, and NASDAQ uh, are doing uh, proof of concept with the issuance and the settlement of, of private security. So uh, one thing that's they all have in common is they're basically all addressing faster settlement and automation of these post-trade processes. Uh, and again, most of them are using private uh, distributed ledgers as well as smart contracts uh, in their stack. Um, smart contracts, for those that are not familiar with them, are basically programmatically enforceable contracts that can be expressed in code and uh, when that code is executed they will debit or credit a distributed asset ledger. Uh, an example, cryptographically secure multi-signature enforcement of payments, for example, in, in an escrow use case, for example. Um, other examples of blockchain proof of concepts that are using smart contracts, the R3, uh, project with Barclays, which is addressing swaps trading, uh, Axoni and DTCC and that whole consortium there that are also uh, working on a, a CDS post-trade process automation project. And there's new protocols that are being created to articulate the terms of these contracts. So, uh, for example, digital, digital Asset Holdings has uh, DAML, Digital Asset Modeling Language, which is uh, specifically designed to uh, address the creation of financial instruments or contracts related to financial instruments that can be programmatically executed. And um, many of these uh, protocols are obviously highly specialized to a particular use case like trading and financial instruments, and they're not Turing complete, which means that you know, they're not designed for arbitrarily complex um, execution of, of, of code. They're, they're really very focused uh, new protocols or languages if you want to think of them that way. We think um, that sort of the holy grail use case is actually not just purely uh, clearing and settlement. We think it really has more to do with the, the credit disintermediation of prime brokers. Um, and an example of that is in the FX world, uh, since the Swiss National Bank event, um, a little more than a year ago, credit has tightened up tremendously. Basically, to get a tier one prime broker relationship in the in the FX market with the likes of uh, really just a handful of players that actually perform that service, the likes of Citibank, B of A, Deutsche, BMP, uh, the minimum balance sheet requirement is about $25 million. So uh, everybody sort of got shaken up a bit. Prior to that, it was you could you could have a relationship potentially with as little as three to five million dollars of balance sheet, um, and what what ultimately ends up happening is is you just you have this uh, this the situation where counterparties to a trade are are trading on credit or through these prime broker relationships with all kinds of agreements that are governed by ISDA and then give up agreements. There's a whole legal uh, just a spider web of legal agreements between these. Uh, parties that face each other on, so that people can trade on credit without uh, and not take counterparty risk with their with the people that they're trading with, and and that is just a, just untenable. You know, we have clients that we've worked with um, that have major tier one prime brokers that haven't been able to onboard a client for for six months just because of. Uh, just just legal difficulties getting all the paperwork processed on their on the side of their prime broker or their client who they wish to face as prime broker. So uh, we we think that there's a technological solution here um, where you can bring together existing real time trading system components, uh, private permission blockchain. Uh, in fact, one that's pretty specialized. Kind of like there's some out there like Settle, uh, for instance, that have sub 10 millisecond uh, commits and, and confirms on, on their private permission blockchain technology. Um, it needs something like that. Obviously, the, the public blockchain and even some of the other technologies we've looked at are, are far too slow to support this kind of complete closed loop system. And then if, with using smart contracts, of course, to replace the existing legal framework. Um, so I'm sorry to talk about it in such vague terms. We're, we're in the middle of uh, filing a number of patents that, that address this. but. Uh, we really believe that that the ability to have a truly peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where clients like 
uh, you know, some of the largest market makers in the space that are non-banks and even the banks uh, can make a price directly to a retail broker who doesn't have a tier one prime brokerage relationship uh, or can make a market even to a, to a retail trader ultimately if we can get around uh, some of the regulatory hurdles that, that, that we're still digging into now. Some of the key considerations for making this fly in the real world, uh, obviously without uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering uh, for any peer that would come onto this network uh, and regulatory reporting, you're pretty much dead on arrival. I, I, I think um, that's obviously critical to uh, putting this kind of a system together. Um, we are endeavoring to avoid holding client funds actually. We think there's a, a significant regulatory arbitrage opportunity here. Uh, and we have a particular solution in mind that uses um, a third-party system that is, sits on top of traditional payment rails uh, that would provide us with a protocol where we could interact uh, for purposes of putting collateral into our network um, and for supporting all of the payments that occur related to settlement and withdrawals from the, from the network. And I think another important part um, you know, from a business point of view of avoiding holding client funds, uh, we really we want to differentiate from just being, you know, a standard brokerage or other firm that that facilitates this kind of trading, uh, you know, this, you know, or other existing exchange models. This is this is really uh, something quite different. Um, and obviously, anonymous and disclosed trading as an option is is really important. I think uh, Stuart mentioned as well. One of the things that's that's beneficial about using a permission blockchain is that uh, the transaction history doesn't have to be entirely open to the public. It can be open to the regulators and it can be open to uh, certain classes of, of peers um, on an, on an opt-in basis, for example. Um, and then I think one other thing that a lot of people forget uh, in looking at, in particular, in looking at Bitcoin exchange technology, um, these things have to scale to, to be a real global ECN. You know, this, this is not something that's going to work with uh, REST APIs and, you know, all of the, the, the very uh, high latency technology stacks that most of these firms are using, which they can, they can use for the moment because they're, they're, these exchanges, uh, you know, as, as I look at the majority of them, they're not really, they're more or less online kiosks for, for exchanging uh, uh, fiat for Bitcoin, for example. They're not necessarily designed to be uh, enterprise uh, exchanges for the, the way that we envision them, you know, having, having run uh, exchanges that are used by clients like, you know, Cantor Fitzgerald, for example. Um, some of the platform extensions that we think are possible with this kind of a system, if we can uh, put this together, is, is, is there could be all sorts of other interesting collateral. Um, you know, we're, we're, I said the holy grail of this is sort of disintermediating the, the, the credit, uh, but I think there is a place for the banks to, instead of providing prime brokerage services, to, to provide a different kind of service, um, such as providing guarantees that can be used as collateral in a network like this. Uh, obviously, a liquid or obscure assets as collateral could be quite interesting. Uh, no idea how we would do that right now, but it's interesting to think about. Um, Obviously, trading any OTC asset with these smart contracts, you know, we're, we're starting off with spot FX, um, but anything anything is possible there, even OTC equities and so forth. Obviously, payments and, and trade finance is another interesting use case as well. So that's my take on uh, the, the blockchain space from a trading point of view. Okay, thanks very much, Rosario. Really interesting, some of the applications here. So, Erica, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on what the legal issues are that arise out of this new technology. Thank you. So, I was just going to give a little bit of a legal primer on what's happening with blockchain uh, and Bitcoin. And before I do that, I kind of want to I want to step back and make sure everyone understands what blockchain is. And from a legal perspective. Uh, how I view it is essentially an automatic meeting of the mind. So there's three steps. First, the party, party A sends a message to the network declaring the transaction. Uh, and that is viewable by everybody who is in this closed system of network computers. And so then party B accepts the transaction, broadcasts it. And then the last step is the network participants, these data miners will verify the transaction's authenticity. And so normally when 
we do contracts from the legal perspective, there's all of this heavy negotiation and the goal, one of the, maybe not goals, but one of the, the great end results with this blockchain is you do away with a lot of inefficiency. So, slides are not moving. There we go. <laughs> and so, a little bit on the regulation on Bitcoin versus blockchain and then the technical legal implications of blockchain. So, as with any innovation, uh, what, what we're seeing with, with blockchain is laws were implemented to regulate specifically only Bitcoin. It was regulated with extreme limited for, uh, foresight because they did, you know, no one really understood the full extent of what you could do with blockchain. And so digital currency regulation is really um, really what, what was originated. So how is digital currency, how is Bitcoin the same as regular money? Uh, U.S. money, it's market-driven value, it's held and transferred, and the big issue is that it's not legally recognized, and that's what makes digital currency different. It doesn't have legal tender status in the U.S. or other countries. It's not backed by any government. And so when you think of digital currency, um, some people might try to compare it to frequent flyer miles or Starbucks stars or any type of bonus points program, but all of those are much more like regular money because they're all uh, underwritten by one person, Starbucks or Amazon or United, my, you know, United Airlines. And so this, is, this, this was the problem with, uh, with digital currency when it began with Bitcoin. And so what happened is we still, the United States and other countries still don't technically recognize it, but um, the federal government, of course, has been trying to enforce uh, unlawful activities that are happening on these platforms. So it started really with, um, in March 2013, we had FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the U.S. Treasury, Treasury responsible for collection analysis of information about financial transactions. So they, in, in March 2013, issued guidance, guidance clarifying that certain businesses or individuals who use or make a business of exchanging, accepting, and transmitting virtual currencies were subject to the requirements uh, of FinCEN under the Bank Secrecy Act, BSA, um, and their goal is to prevent money laundering. Uh, since then, both the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, and the DOJ, Department of Justice, have, uh, have started enforcing, enforcing this through actual lawsuits. Uh, the IRS has also stepped in. They, uh, in March 2014, sent out a note which even complicated matters further, further by saying that virtual currency is actually property instead of money. And so what happens there is virtual currency then is considered a security in the IRS's view. And so when you use Bitcoin or when you use digital currency, when you trade it, there could be taxes on the increases in value. Uh, next we have the CFTC, which is the Community Futures Trading Commission. They regulate commodities futures. And their, their job is to avoid systemic risk and protect market users. And they, uh, I think in 2014, they said that they believe they could control price manipulation on the Bitcoin market. Uh, lastly, another big enforcement agency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, they sent out a consumer advisory statement in August warning consumers about uh, the potential risk of digital currency hackers um, and issues with the, the Bitcoin and other currencies not being uh, backed by a government. So when you when you put money in a bank, it's FDIC insured, and that is not the case when you put it out there on the digital currency exchanges. On a state regulation side, um, really two uh, avenues are being used. Uh, most states are taking the wait and see approach, where they're essentially just saying we're you know we're not going to license uh, these businesses. Uh, specifically in Wisconsin on their website, that is exactly what they say. The division is unwilling at this time to license companies to transmit virtual, virtual currency. However, 
they do acknowledge that those they have licensed may transmit virtual currency. And uh, Vermont just put out, the, sec uh, the Attorney General of Vermont just put out this, uh, the study essentially saying there was no benefit, economic benefit for Vermont trying to regulate currency at this time, digital currency at this time. Uh, the biggest uh, state player would be New York, who actually their Department of Financial Services did set up this regulatory framework for bit licenses. So that is the regulation of digital currency, per se. And now we're going to move on to blockchain. Um, so with what I started, blockchain technology can really transfer anything of value, not just currency. And so when you start thinking about the implications of the technology as a whole, um, some of the things it could transfer would be title records. Uh, I already mentioned securities. Uh, Rosario already mentioned smart contracts. And so the reason you're still going to need lawyers is because you still have to understand the legal requirements of any object being transferred. So with title records, proper, that, that, that is property law uh, or could be any type of ownership for property, let's say you have a car. And that's really uh, gaining traction in the emerging markets because it's really understood in third world countries that uh, poverty, one, one reason poverty is so uh, profound in third world countries is lack of ownership of property. And securities, you know, on a, on, from a legal standpoint, we deal every day with uh, trying to get these agreements signed, stock purchase agreements, um, and also privacy issues. There are a lot of people on the private security market side who don't necessarily want people to know what they're buying or what they're investing in. And so that could be a problem with blockchain because the whole transaction is completely um, completely viewable to anyone in the network. Uh, smart contracts, briefly mentioned, I think the legal implication here is um, irreversibility. So when I was saying automatic meeting of the minds, what happens is we, as there are these triggering conditions, and you can think of them as levers. If condition A and condition B all the way down to condition E meet, that, can, that transaction will automatically go through. Well, what happens if that transaction or that contract is fraudulent? You know, what's the benefit of using blockchain? And right now, there is no benefit on that end. You can take it to the court. Um, but if you, there's no, because there's no one party to just appeal to, you're appealing to this network of computers, it's really hard to change information on the blockchain once it's already happened. So that are some of the legal implications of blockchain and Bitcoin technology. Okay, well, thanks very much, Erica. Certainly, uh, the law is going to have to evolve to, to keep up with this for sure. So, Ryan, are you there? I am. Okay, uh, maybe you could uh, give us a little bit about what, what the future is of blockchain. I, you know, we've done uh, presentations here before on, on Bitcoin, and we've kind of been through a lot of the issues there. But, I mean, this is certainly a, a much different area and a, a huge expansion. Uh, how do you see this developing? Yeah, so just for a little bit of background, I've been an entrepreneur in this space. Uh, since uh, about 2011 and in 2012 I founded a company called Trade Hill which was really the first institutional Bitcoin exchange. Our clients were billionaires and hedge funds and Bitcoin startups and we were really a center of liquidity for the marketplace until we shut down in December uh, 2013. Um, and since then I've been working on things like smart contracts with a company called CryptoCorp that was bought by Digital Asset Holdings and now I'm working on two companies, Blockchain Clearing, which intends to use a kind of smart contract infrastructure and uh, the blockchain to store clearing information to allow for a rapid clearing process on top of the existing central securities clearing mechanisms. And then the other one, Blockchain Health, intended to help uh, uh, patients custody and permission their own private health information and build a broader market 
for health information, not based on the current basis, which is de-identification and aggregation, but instead based on a new world where people custody their own records in a decentralized fashion. And when you want to aggregate records about a particular thing, you get permission directly from the patients. And you build a brokerage business based on consent instead of based on de-identification. So um, it's been a really interesting path these last couple of years. Um, looking forward, I think right now there's a lot of confusion about the technology. I think the press has kind of adopted blockchain as a buzzword to mean kind of any cryptographically secure communication and data, which is um, which is frustrating, right? Um, a lot of people who uh, who got into the space really early actually object to the characterization that I heard earlier in the call that blockchain is a technology that powers Bitcoin. Because, frankly, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the other way around. That Bitcoin is the, is the technology that powers the blockchain, right? Um, if you look at the original Bitcoin white paper that Satoshi published, um, and you search for the word blockchain with no space, it just doesn't show up at all. There was, there was no conception of this idea before Bitcoin came out. And Bitcoin came out establishing kind of a really profound new system that nobody had ever considered. First of all, it was not uh, high performance, right? Bitcoin was designed to be deliberately slow. In fact, with uh, one write operation per 10 minutes, I'd say at the time it was released in late 2008, early 2009, it was probably the slowest database in the world, right? <laughs> and then, um, you know, you compare that to uh, to the previous efforts at kind of technical consensus within a transactional database, um, like the efforts to use practical Byzantine fault tolerance (PBFT) to do distributed databases, and you know their goals were you know tens of thousands of writes operations per second, even uh, hundreds of thousands of write operations per second, and so that Bitcoin can only take ten transactions per second and only writes them once every ten minutes was a severe departure. But because it stopped optimizing for speed and efficiency and, uh, and kind of let go of those as design requirements, it was able to do something that had never been done before, which is it created a global network that was a flat peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, just like BitTorrent, where literally no difference between peers. They were, none of them were more important than any of the others, and it didn't matter who owned them. And on top of that flat peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, it was able to build the largest public key infrastructure for identity that the world had ever seen, larger than the one the Department of Defense runs, which is the largest public key infrastructure run by a legal entity. Um, and it was able to build on top of that strong identity layer and that strong transactional consensus layer um, the first database of information that's uh, right once that grows over time, that actually prior rights become more secure over time instead of less. And this is such a crucial innovation that you really can't underestimate its level of importance for the future of the human race. For the first time, we have a data structure that we can all look at, that we can all refer to, where the, uh, the past rights become more set in stone over time and less likely to be, uh, to be changed. And this is because of the, frankly, bizarre system that Satoshi came up with, where he used Adam Back's uh, proof, of, uh, proof of work algorithms, which were intended to provide postage stamps for email. And he instead chained them together and said, every computer on this network is going to be working hard to play this lottery game, and the winner gets to do the next right. But in order to decide which database you're looking at, you look at the total cumulative work that had been done for every new block going all the way back to the beginning. So every time you add a block, everybody else wants to start adding a block on top of yours instead of in competition with yours to gain the benefit of that extra work. And as a result, um, right now, if you were to co-opt, say, all of the computers owned by uh, nation states in general, like the computers owned by the US, the computers owned by China, total them all up. 
um, you'd end up getting to a computing network of about the same power as the Bitcoin network, which would allow you uh, to be able to try and change transactions from the last like 20 or 30 minutes or so. But transactions older than that, you would actually have to focus your effort of, uh, of a computing network that was not just intended to keep up with the current work that the blockchain network was doing, but also intended to keep up with current work while redoing past work. So if you wanted to go back and change an entry from six months ago, it would probably take uh, about a year's worth of output of all of the, um, all of the uh, ability that we have to print semiconductors right now. Like you'd have to go over TSMC, stop them from producing iPhones, and get them focused on producing hardware just to attack the transaction from a year ago. If you wanted to attack a transaction from three years ago, you'd probably be out of luck um, given the amount of matter and energy available. Like for productive use of human humanity, so this kind of uh, security of past records is a superpower that the human race has never had before. Um, past records for banks are not this secure. Past records for governments are not this secure. The past records for Social Security are not this secure. The past records for the CIA are not this secure. So this in so this amazing invention has brought us a global public key infrastructure that's useful for transactional identity everywhere in the world, has brought us to this global um, database that anybody can write to where old rights become more secure over time and become effectively permanent very, very quickly compared to other ways to permanently write data in public view. And, um, and third, it brings what, uh, what earlier speakers were getting into, which is kind of this transactional value of moving information from place to place. And so I, I agree with kind of the broader thesis that, uh, that the uses of the blockchain far exceed uses of the digital currency Bitcoin. But it's important to remember that, that those huge innovations um, of this global public key infrastructure of this right once read by anybody more secure over time database you know of of these sources of value of this uh, publicly enforced smart contracting with which like Erica said you know the, the judge is the public network that's flat that's only influenced algorithmically and publicly not related to individual transactions um, these innovations are so incredible and for the most part, they're powered by Bitcoin. You know, these, uh, these permission ledgers, they have a place and they're important technology, but they're important technology that, you know, a lot of these firms and a lot of these companies have been working on um, decades before Bitcoin came out. PBFT, which is the, uh, the consensus algorithm that's most popular for these permission blockchains, um, last last experience a significant patent in advance in uh, 1985 and those patents are now available for public use um, so th these systems a lot of the value that they bring uh, doesn't come from innovations in the last few years from blockchain a lot of the value they bring was from the fact that they were ignored before Bitcoin brought this idea of distributed consensus transactionally to the public eye and blockchain became this popular marketing term and, and that's allowing people to reevaluate these, uh, these very centralized pyramid-like structures they built and try to, and try to re-engineer them and redesign them. But it's important in that, in that rush in, while we're reevaluating all of our core systems, while we're reevaluating, you know, clearing and settlement systems and post-trade processing systems and healthcare information IT systems and, um, it, and smart contract testing systems and di dispute resolution systems, you know, all of these different things that are getting re-architected right now. It's worth noting um, kind of where the value is and making sure that you go for that. And right now, I'd say the biggest value is, one, a decentralized identity mechanism is accessible for the first time, is useful for the first time. You don't have to rely on flawed certificate authorities to be able to say this is the device that I'm talking to. Two, decentralized transaction processing 
and contact resolution possible for the first time. You don't have to rely on an arbiter to have arbitration. Um, and that's pretty exciting. And three, and perhaps most exciting, is there's a place that you can permanently write things in stone, improve the state of a particular database, prove the state of your proofs of records, demonstrate the state of your health information, demonstrate a contract of consent, you know, all of these different things that before people used to argue in court about whether or not they happened. And it was very, very difficult to publish facts irrevocably. And now you can do it for a 10 cent transaction fee in a way that's not only irrevocable but irrefutable. And, and irrefutably came from a particular device at a particular time that was associated with a particular account. And th these kinds of, uh, of broad things are going to kind of reevaluate basically all systems in which you had to have um, gatekeepers and centralized trust infrastructures in order to be able to do this kind of work at all. So if, if I were you as an investor or I were you as an entrepreneur looking at new businesses to get involved in or new technologies to experiment with or new markets to penetrate, the places I would look are the places that suffer the most from their centralized gatekeepers and from the arbitrary act, eh, uh, uh, use of power from the centralized gatekeepers. You know, so people talk about blockchain and real estate a lot, but honestly, I don't think the centralized gatekeepers or, or the abuses of power in the U.S. are that bad, right? You look at um, escrow and title insurance and stuff like that, and it's an inefficient and it's wasteful, but it's um, but it's a process that's relatively easy to go through, and we have a booming real estate market. It's highly transactional. Meh. But you look at uh, real estate in um, in the poorer parts of India and basically all of Africa except for South Africa and maybe a couple of big cities and uh, how real estate works in those areas is the big man, the government, uh, when they want property they seize it and if someone sues them to stop it there's a civil court that goes through the evidence that that person legitimately had the property and if they, uh, if they prove it basically to a preponderance of evidence in civil court they get to keep their property and if they don't then the government was right to take it and sell it because obviously everyone on it were squatters. And <laughs> that's, that's how real estate works there. So having this public, irrevocable, write-only database that you can use for those kinds of proof builds in that kind of trust and that kind of infrastructure, and that's, that's going to be a huge step forward. Um, likewise, in healthcare in the U.S., um, pretty much all healthcare data is brokered through and processed through these uh, EMR systems, which um, which are provided by these multi-billion dollar companies that basically operate as systems integrators. And so given that the gatekeepers of healthcare IT are these major hospitals and the systems integrators they employ, um, the more incompatibility there is between systems, the more money the gatekeepers make. So as a result, uh, healthcare data does not travel at all. And it's... Uh, and permissioning this data is very difficult, patient sharing, uh, coordinating this data is very difficult, research getting their hands on this data is really difficult. Um, the, there's an exchange economy around bundling it, but, it's, but they bundle it under, under de-identification. So healthcare data is a biometric, like if you, uh, by definition, right, like the difference between data and Roger's health data is only useful to the extent that it can tell the difference between me and Roger. So for it to be perfectly de-identified, it has to become perfectly useless. And so these, these aggregations, they're lightly de-identified. Anytime you aggregate it, re-identification becomes possible and even at some point assured. This is a, this is a market where um, healthcare, where blockchain comes in provide, providing this kind of infrastructure, decentralized identity, decentralized transaction processing, uh, decentralized contract enforcement, it provides the ability for high-level permissioning, for um, for more uh, for more reasonable bottom-up market forces, and so these are the kinds of markets I would look at for what can you what can you use blockchain technology to unlock billions or trillions of dollars worth of value. You look at the places that are suffering because transacting is hard, because uh, a meeting of a minds is hard because gatekeepers are extracting unreasonable tolls because they have to give permission because they often say no 
those are the kind of markets that really have a lot of value, I think. Okay, well, Ryan, thanks, thanks very much for that. You know, I'd like to invite our listeners, if you have questions, to go ahead and type them into the question or the chat box. Uh, please mute your phone at Echo here. Everybody mute. Um, but you know, one thing as I listen to Ryan, you talk about the applications here, it seems to me, I mean, I'll accept the premise that really Bitcoin power is blockchain. But, um, you know, Bitcoin, we did a webinar on Bitcoin two years ago here, and, and we all thought that it was going to replace currency. And it, and it seems to me that, you know, it hasn't really taken off like we thought it would, probably because of these regulatory challenges uh, that Erica went through. Plus, the IRS hasn't really been very kind to it as well, treating it as property. Um, so it strikes me that, like any other innovation, that where it has the greatest chance of success is where you've got the, the less entrenched regulatory structure. I mean, take a look at, at, at you know Uber and Lyft, the problems they're having because there are you know there are taxis, uh, taxi unions that, that don't like being displaced, and and there's a worker protection uh, idea that uh, you know that that challenges that. And with Bitcoin, we have just a very extensive currency regulation uh, environment. But then I look at healthcare, I think you may run into the same problems. Uh, any place that's heavily regulated is hard to change and it's hard to innovate. But you think of some of these other areas uh, that I had mentioned that, that are a lot less regulated, it seems to me that that might be the lower hanging fruit. Do any of our panelists have any thoughts on that, especially Stuart or VC, because I know you're looking at this to invest in and make money. Hey there, this is Stuart. So uh, in short, we are going to be looking at ways in which this technology fundamentally changes the structure of either an existing uh, economy or creates a new economy. So I don't know that I'm on a macro level. I, I, I agree with the sentiment of the, the positive societal changes that Bitcoin and blockchain can bring. Uh, I further agree. I mean, one of the things we're talking about in this call, the fiat currencies want to remain fiat currency. And this is a threat in many different levels to to that supremacy. So it would make sense that the very easiest thing to do is, rather than incorporate it, simply deny it or or change it. From our perspective, the currency element is important, and the currency element is, and the transactional value is a critical piece. Uh, it's ways in which this can facilitate that chain of custody. It's ways in which this can uh, accelerate inefficient, complex, or over-regulated, or in inefficiently regulated uh, markets. I agree with all of that. That's where we're, we're, we're looking to extract value. And it's where can this facilitate uh, either the removal of friction from an existing infrastructure or a workaround where the markets are inherently inefficient. That's, that's where we see value. And part of the, the reason why we're looking less in terms of a pure currency play and more at, and I think it was exactly right, unlocking the, uh, the latent value within a system, that's where we see the real uh, transactional value in, in, in this play. There's been a lot of talk about ways to forensically identify and qualify data or qualify files within a system. I, I, we believe that there is a, a there there. But there is a there's a need for demonstrating the low hanging fruit, demonstrating the, the the value of the system before we get to that level of granularity. So one example could be creating, as I was mentioning early, creating chain of custody issues for virtual goods, or even earlier than that, creating a trust mechanism for for physical goods that don't have efficient mechanisms. These are these are macro things that we're looking for. Uh, and where we think that 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 value, that uh, latent value, can be freed. Okay, well, thanks very much, Stuart. You know, I see we're at the top of the hour here. Uh, I know we could we could talk about this for a long time, any one of these aspects. But uh, I just want to remind folks that that this has been recorded along with the materials. You can find them at Royce University, uh, as well as on the Royce Law YouTube site. And also, uh, we have upcoming webinars uh, on various aspects of new, tech, new and innovative technologies. On May 23rd, we have uh, augmented and virtual reality, uh, 10 a.m. May 23rd. 
uh, FinTech on May 26, Artificial Intelligence on June 7, Health Tech on June 21st, uh, and Water Tech on June 29th, uh, just as an example. So make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter so you can be kept surprised of this. Well, I'd really like to thank our panel for being here. Uh, I certainly learned a lot today. Uh, this is a new and exciting field. I, I think I can see that people expect this to be a really, really big thing. And, uh, you know, you, you probably didn't hear it here first, but you certainly heard it here. And we're, we're going to keep a close eye on this. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thank you, panel. Thank you, attendees. And we will see you at the next one. Thank you very much, Roger. Thanks, everyone.